Super. Okay. Uh, announcements. Don't forget the picnic on October the 13th, and we've got uh, volleyball challenge. So Jeff will be leading the weekly uh, PT um, West Houston Bible Church workout sessions and uh, a- aerobic exercise <laughs> on a week- weekly basis. He is. Uh, so he's he's in charge of getting everybody in, in shape, and the uh, he'll be the volleyball coach, right? Right, Jeff? Yeah. yeah, that's right. See, that's what you do if you're a camp director. You got to be a little bit of everything. Right. All right. <clears throat> trust in the Lord with trust in the Lord with all your. What, I just blanked out on that. Very good. I want to see if anybody's listening. <laughs> How many of y'all have those all those verses memorized now? And then I get to change to something else. That's why I do that, is so everybody will memorize those verses, because you're not going to go home and do it. The Word of God That's right. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, so you can make sure you're in fellowship and ready to study the word. Then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful we can be here tonight because we know that that which gives stability, strength, certainty to our lives is your word. It is our anchor. And Father, we recognize that we live in a world today that has slipped their anchor and they have cast adrift upon uh, the stormy seas of a world system and cosmic thinking that is ultimately self-destructive. And yet, we know there is truth, we know there are answers, and no matter what the storms of life may bring, we know that we have stability and hope, confidence, strength in your word and in your care for us. Now, Father, we pray that as we continue our study this evening, that you would uh, strengthen us, help us as in our focus on this study, that we might recognize our responsibilities as witnesses, evangelists, those who are proclaiming the truth of your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, a couple of things tonight before we get get started in our in our passage. We'll be back in Isaiah 53. But I was ju- just got this letter. Where'd Sandy go? Sandy, there you are. Okay, we need to answer this. Um, this is uh, a, a, a request from a uh, for some uh, assistance, which we probably can't provide because the Lord hasn't provided for us in that way just now. But it's encouraging to have this kind of a request. It's uh, addressed to me, and he says, introduces himself, my name is Peter Tile. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. I am a native Czech, 38 years old, living with my family in Czech Republic. I've got, I, I was saved in 1992 through the ministry of Greater Grace Church in Prague that was established in 1991. In 19, and that, for those of you who haven't factored it, that's right after the Soviet Union collapsed. The wall came down when just a host of missionaries penetrated the old Iron Curtain area. In '95, I started uh, Bible School of Prague, and in 2000, I graduated from the Maryland Bible College and Seminary with a four-year bachelor's degree. I was ordained a pastor by Greater Grace World Outreach of Baltimore, Maryland, and officially took over the church in Prague in 2005. I'm writing to you because I appreciate your ministry, and I share the same... I've never heard of this person before. Uh, ...share the same free grace viewpoint of Christianity. I, too, deeply admire the work of Lewisbury Chafer. I appreciate your teaching that is available at your webpage very much. 
spirit, uh, the spiritual situation in the Czech Republic is very sad. The majority of Christian churches in the Czech Republic are either charismatic, dead traditional, or legalistic. Same as in Ukraine. Uh, even if the free grace is taught, at least in a theoretical way in relation to salvation in so, some small circles, it is definitely not preached openly or in relation to sanctification and the Christian walk. Actually, in my 20 years of Christian life, I've never heard anyone speak about sanctification by grace except from the wrong theological perspective of extreme Calvinism. As far as I know, except us, nobody is clearly teaching free grace as the basis for salvation and sanctification. I've been self-employed since 2003, working in the area of marketing, architecture, photography, and web design. I would like to minister full-time as a pastor and go forward in our vision for the Czech Republic. In our present capacity, we have Sunday services, two Bible school classes, regular Bible studies. Uh, in the city of, uh, it looks like Poda Brady, P-O-D-E-B-R-A-D-Y, and once a month, uh, which is about 30 miles from the capital, once a month we undergo longer trips to bigger, to larger cities in Czech, such as Libres. Since 1991, the church grew to about 60 people and 15 gradu- graduate students of Bible school reaching the peak in 2000. At the moment, we have a church of about 20 people in Prague, five people in Poda Brady, and four people in Libres. We do evangelism in the street at least once a week. Our vision is now focused on, uh, to, on a new revision of the traditional Czech Bible, which is, was originally translated in 1613, probably by Jan Hus, if I'm not mistaken. Translation of uh, books about free grace, publication of articles about free grace on our pages focused on a wide Czech Christian audience, and he gives a website. So he uh, expressed his appreciation for uh, Dean Bible Ministries, for reading his letter, and he says, even if you can't financially support our church, we're thankful for your prayers, your preaching, and teaching ministry. So his name is Peter Till, T-Y-L-L, and we certainly need to put someone like that on our prayer list. We're in Isaiah 53. The reason we're in Isaiah 53 is because this is the passage, as we've seen, that the Ethiopian eunuch is reading. And we're going to conclude both Isaiah 53 and Acts 8 tonight. And the thing that we should not lose track of in this study is that this is ultimately about an evangelistic, uh, an evangelistic ministry of Philip, and we see one important facet that is critical in this church age, and that is the role of God the Holy Spirit. But even though God the Holy Spirit has a role, and God the Holy Spirit is the one who is guiding, directing, and overseeing the process, it is not at the expense of or apart from human responsibility. Philip has a responsibility to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit to go to the road from Jerusalem to Gaza and to talk with the Ethiopian eunuch and to help him understand what it is that he is is reading. Now, as we're concluding Acts 8, because we're very close to the end of the chapter, I've taken the time to go off and talk about Isaiah 53 for a while to further understand the background for what what, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading. When we finish Acts 8, we start Acts 9, which tells us of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. And I want briefly to put this into your mind so we start thinking about this. We see a a comparison and contrast here between the mindset of the Ethiopian eunuch and Saul of Tarsus. The Ethiopian eunuch is very overtly, let me use that word, overtly positive to the Word of God. He is reading the Old Testament. He's reading Isaiah. He wants to know what it means. He is probably, a pro- what I said earlier, a proselyte at the gate, which indicates that he is somewhat observant of most of the uh, Mosaic law, but he, because he's a eunuch, he's prevented from becoming a full proselyte uh, to Judaism. But he has a well-grounded frame of reference 
for understanding the the uh, uh, the Old Testament and the background uh, relate in, in light of all of the sacrifices and feasts and everything in terms of that framework for understanding the basic message of the Old Testament, even though it's not clear in his head, he wants to know the truth. Now, we haven't, we've barely been introduced to Saul of Tarsus. We were introduced to him at the end of chapter 7 as, the, as just a young man who's standing there watching, cheering on probably the stoning of Stephen, and he's the one who watched over everybody's garments and robes as they took them off and, and stoned Stephen. He is going to be become the focus in Acts 9, and we're going to see him as the prime persecutor of Christianity. If you were to spend time talking to the Ethiopian eunuch the day before he met Philip, I want you to think about what kind of person he would have been in terms of his openness and interest in the Word of God. And what about the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, as an unbeliever? He had arguably the most extensive understanding of the Old Testament at that time. He was a student of Gamaliel, who was the foremost rabbi at that time, and and uh, though Saul of Tarsus was a young man, he was probably the most brilliant student, rabbinical student of his generation. And yet he is extremely hostile to Christianity. The Ethiopian eunuch was not hostile. Now, I want you to think about this because so often when we are talking to someone we know, if, th- if they put up their defenses like Saul of Tarsus would, we would too flippantly write them off as, well, they're just negative. They're not going to turn around. How many of you would have thought, 30 minutes before Jesus appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, that he would, I'm not even going to say be the greatest apostle, the greatest Bible teacher of all time, but that he would even lighten up on his hostility to Christians. None of us would expect that. I think too often we run into people in our lives that are that way, and we, we retreat too much, and we, ret- we back off, and we just it's easy for us to be dismissive and say, well, they're just negative. They're just not really interested. How do we know that there won't be a point when they'll change? And, and you've heard me tell the story of, professor of military science when I went to college, uh, Jim Callahan. It took about 30 years or more uh, before he responded to the gospel. And I received a phone call yesterday from a good friend of mine and a regular listener, live streamer uh, from, from West Houston, who's a lawyer, and his law partner uh, passed away, went to be with the Lord this last weekend. That gives away the end of the story. His law port partner was a dyed-in-the-wool, hardcore Roman Catholic working his way to heaven until three weeks before he died. Over that period of time, his partner who listens, another partner who also live streams and listens, regularly and consistently gave him the gospel over the last 30 years. He was married to a uh, a, a wife who w- loved the Lord and was an evangelical Christian, and whose brother was an evangelical pa- or is an evangelical pastor, and they gave him the gospel again and again and again. So here's somebody who's prob- who probably heard the gospel at least fifty times, maybe close to a hundred times, and until four weeks ago, consistently put up a, a barrier and refused to accept it. None of us know how many times that seed needs to be watered by us, needs to be weeded by us, needs to be watched over by us, that when the Holy Spirit will finally break down that barrier that somebody has has erected. They're not all going to be like the Ethiopian eunuch, where they're just, all all they need is just walk up to them and just kind of, and they... And they're going to respond. Some of them, it's going to take years. And it may be, 
it may be that you're just one person in a stream of 50, 60, or 70 that give that person the gospel. And it may be that you're the person who needs to have a relationship with that person, become their friend, get to know them, not just as a target for evangelism, but understanding that it may take the rest of your life explaining the gospel to that person before they finally uh, respond on their deathbed. And we usually don't think of witnessing that way. And too often, the evangelical community and too often uh, too many Christians have adopted sort of a drive-by evangelism approach. Now, there are times when you and I, and I talked about one example last week, when that's the only opportunity we have is just to, just to fire something out real quick. But most of the time, that's not real effective. Unless it happens to be someone like the Ethiopian eunuch who's just just all but ready to domino. They're just right there. and and it's, But often they're not. And you may just be another person that says something. And if the Holy Spirit's working in their life, you may get a, a, an extremely negative reaction like, like Saul of Tarsus. Because they're reacting to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So I think it's just interesting to look at the comparison and contrast between these two people and their response to the gospel because we so often, when we think about witnessing, we have these these little patterns, we have these, we put people in a little little box and we think that one size fits all and we just need to learn the same approach and we just need to relax and, and be genuine I'm not going to use the word authentic. It's so overused today. It means nothing anymore. We just need to be somebody's, in a lot of cases, just somebody's friend. And genuinely, I had a Jewish businessman tell me one time, he said, if I thought for a second that that your ulterior motive was to make me a Christian, that'd be the last time I ever talked to you. If, if, If that is our mentality then that will come through and it comes and, and it makes our understanding of the gospel our relationship with god come across as as something that is that is very artificial so we need to and the only thing that can change that for us individually is when as we've been studying on on sunday mornings the word of christ takes up residence inside of us. It's not just, we haven't just memorized some sort of approach to giving the gospel. Now, when you're young and new as a believer, that's that's sort of what kindergartners and first graders do. But as you study, as we study, as we think about the word, we just have to learn to respond to whatever circumstances and situations come up. And so we need to have at our fingertips, our mental fingertips, control and understanding of these passages, and ultimately it's in the Lord's hands. Ultimately it's the Holy Spirit. That's the great thing. It's not up to you and it's not up to me. I don't have to say it perfectly. I don't have to come out with a quick, glib answer. I don't have to be uh, intellectually astute. I don't have to know all the facts. I do have to be able to clearly, genuinely give the gospel. So we're in Isaiah 53, just backing up a little bit. Isaiah 53, 5, I mean, this section really does focus on, and we cannot escape, the whole emphasis on substitution. And this idea, think about this, this idea of substitutionary payment of a legal penalty is really foreign to our culture today. I pointed this out at one point early on in our uh, study of this in terms of evangelism, that if you speak to many Many people who are not Christians and have never had much of an influence from a Judeo-Christian framework, the idea of a substitutionary payment is to them sounds unjust. What have they just done? They'll say, well, that's not fair that somebody could take the penalty for somebody else. What, what have they just done? They have imposed their view of justice upon God. And so as we're explaining the gospel to them, we ought to figure out a way to expose that, not just say, oh, you dummy, you're just forcing God into your, your viewpoint. We have, to, we have to think about that. And I think that as we, as we think about that, 
what we need to do is lay a foundation. And how, where would you start with that foundation? I would start with Genesis 22. Especially if I was dealing with somebody with a Jewish background. You start with Genesis 22. What's the story there? God tells Abraham to take his son, his only son, to Mount, uh, the mountains of Moriah, and there to sacrifice him to God. Now, God never intended for Abraham to actually kill uh, Isaac. How do we know that? Very simply, because God had told Abraham that it would be through Isaac that he would have descendants that would be more numerous than the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. So obviously God intended to to give Abraham an innumerable num- a number of descendants through through Isaac. Isaac was the promised seed, but he wanted to test Abraham to see if Abraham really be- had finally gotten to that point where he trusted God. And so you know the story, you're familiar with the story. Abraham takes Isaac and they travel to Jerusalem, uh, that area that became Jerusalem to Mount Moriah, which is believed by the Jews to be the Temple Mount. And there he uh, was. He built a, the, the altar to sacrifice Isaac, and he took out, had Isaac lay down on the altar and took out his knife, and at that point God stayed his hand, and what happened? There was a ram caught in the bushes that was to be offered instead of Isaac. That was the substitute. And then go from there to the whole principle of substitutionary sacrifice, and then go to the principle of the Passover and the substitution of the lamb's blood on the door for the life of the firstborn, and from there to the Day of Atonement. Just walk through this concept showing that the Bible, from the very beginning affirms the principle of a substitutionary payment because the person that is guilty is incapable of ever fulfilling the kind of that kind of payment that would redeem them they can only be condemned and so i think that's important thinking it like an unbeliever thinks and helping them to to walk through that change of thinking because it, 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 just laying the principle out there sometimes uh, it just contradicts everything that they've they've come to understand that we have to f- fill in that content ahead of time. That's not true for everybody, but it is true for some people. I have a I have a, <clears throat> a friend that about once a year he'll start asking me in a devil's advocate hostility kind of way. Why do you believe what you believe? Come on, just you know th- you can't really believe all this Jesus stuff. And then he will start with this string. It's amazing how fast somebody can remember and, and just talk about and, and run out this whole string of, of opposition to Christianity. Well, the, the Bible was written. Those guys wrote the Bible, wrote it 300 years after Jesus died. They, they, they weren't really his disciples. How did anybody know anything? Just, you know, it's like somebody memorized the Discovery Channel and uh, all the. Uh, all the negatives that are presented against Christianity. And I got to wait for him to take a breath. And I say, okay, just stop there. You've given 15 objections. I just want to deal with one. And each year it's like one more. If, I, if I'm successful, I feel like I move the ball down the field two inches. Next year it's two more inches. The next year it's two more inches. Hopefully one day we'll get to the end zone. But... Uh, you, sometimes that's all we have is those little, little things, and, and he throws up his sense, okay, okay, I, I can't use that anymore, I guess. So every situation, every circumstance is different. In this circumstance, we have this Ethiopian who is, for all practical purposes, Jewish in his thinking acceptance of the Old Testament, but he hasn't put everything together yet. He's reading Isaiah 53, and in Isaiah 53, he has, he has been confronted with this substitutionary terminology, talking about this servant of God, that he was wounded for our transgressions. Again, an emphasis on substitution. The reason he had, and the wounding here is really a piercing that is a, a, a fatal piercing, 
He is wounded or pierced fatally for our transgressions and bruised, which means crushed, for our iniquities. And the idea here is that, that it's a payment for sin. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we were healed. The reason for this was then stated, as we saw last week, in verse 6. All of us. Now this is... This may be when, when uh, this, th- there may be a shift to Isaiah speaking at this time. Uh, some people think that, but it's probably still that, that, that original group that is usually thought to be a future group of, 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 of Jews that have understood who the Messiah is. And they're reflecting back on their failure to identify him. And in verse 6, they express the reason that he needs to die for our transgressions is that all we. Now, the we, at the very least, has to refer to every Jew. At most, it refers to every human being, which it would include. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. So what we see here is that the burden for sin, the penalty for sin, is put, laid. It is, he is the one who pays that that penalty. And then in verse 7, we read of his response to bearing that penalty. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Now, when we get into this section, this is a section that is quoted in Acts 8. And so I wanted to come back a little bit and just mention a few things about this. What does this mean that he was oppressed and he was afflicted? This is extremely difficult to translate in the Hebrew. There's a lot of debate over what some of these terms mean and how these things are to be are, are to be expressed. And the Septuagint translation, which is what is quoted in Acts 8, is a little bit different. And I think it's helpful to understand the, to look at that to understand the gist of what is being said here in the original Hebrew, because the Septuagint version seems to sort of summarize the meaning of, of Acts, I mean, of Isaiah 53 7 without giving a, a, a direct translation of it. This opening statement by oppression and judgment is a probably a Hebrew idiom that is related to the idea of, of his arrest and his judgment. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Now, last time I talked about the fact that this, this relates to the unjustness of his, of his trials, that there were actually six trials, and that according to the Mishnah, as we have it, these trials would have violated the Jewish laws for a just trial. However, as I pointed out, the Mishnah that we have was codified in the middle of the next century by Rabbi Judah the Prince, and some of these uh, principles might not have been in effect at the time of Christ. We, we don't have any way of, of knowing that. Uh, but it begins, he was oppressed, he was afflicted. This is emphasizing his arrest and judgment. Yet he opened not his mouth. So throughout that process, he doesn't say anything. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. I was going to look for a slide I had here. I think I got it out of place. Or I'm out of place. Here we go. So he's led like a lamb to the slaughter. This word, in the, as it's translated in the Septuagint, is the word uh, arnion for, for lamb. And this is only used four, four times in the New Testament. It is an important word. Notice how where the passage is where it's, where it's used. When Jesus comes down to the Jordan where John the Baptist is baptizing, in John one twenty nine, we read, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The next 
day, Jesus comes down, and John says the same thing, looking at Jesus as he walked. He said, Behold the Lamb of God. So two of the other references are right there in John, with John the Baptist identifying Jesus as the Lamb of God. Acts 8.32 is the third use. 1 Peter 1.19 is the fourth use that we were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our empty manner of life, which is 1 Peter 1.18, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. This is a direct reference to the Passover lamb that had to be qualified to be, to be used as a sacrifice and it had to be evaluated and watched to make sure it was without, uh, without spot or blemish. So Jesus is identified by this phraseology that uniquely identifies him with the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament sacrifice, with the Old Testament sacrifice. So he is uh, cut. Uh, he's taken. Let me back this up again. He's oppressed. And he is afflicted. This is the idea of his being taken to judgment. Identified as a, like a lamb to the slaughters, a sheep before shears, shears is silent. He opened not his mouth. He doesn't protest the unjustness of his condemnation. Not once. Verse 8 we read, He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? Now, this is also an, a, a difficult, difficult passage to translate from the Hebrew for, for several different reasons. I'm going to give you a corrected translation here at the bottom of this slide. <clears throat> it, the, the issue is how to punctuate this line, who will declare his generation? Is that the question? And, and that's taking the, the Hebrew word door here as his descendants or his generation, who's going to declare his generation? Does that end the sentence? Or is that, should that be retranslated, who will declare to his generation? Something of that nature. The corrected translation I put below on the slide, yet who of his generation considered, see there's a, see it's moving the verb uh, later, Yet who of his generation considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the blow was due? Taking this as an entire sentence. Now this is not my translation. In fact, this is, an all, this is not even the translation of the NIV, but if you've got an NIV and you look in the margin, this is, their, this is an alternate translation. I remember when I had Al Ross for uh, Hebrew word studies. Al was the head of the Old Testament department at Dallas, had his doctorate from Dallas in Hebrew, had his second doctorate from Cambridge in Hebrew, uh, one of the most highly qualified evangelical Hebrew scholars in, in the world still to this day. And he was on the translation committee for the NIV. And in passages like this, he would say, I, I really wanted to have them put in the margin, this is the word of God by a vote of five to four. Because the translation was a committee translation. And so at the end of the day, they would take a vote as to which they th- thought was the better, better translation. And so, so often it came down to things of that, that nature. So this is, this is how uh, an alternate that I think is in the um, margin of the NIV. And it's very close. If you look at the second part of that, focusing on the fact that he's cut off from the land of the living, which would mean death, for the transgression of my people. So he, again, this, this gives us that substitutionary idea. He's cut off from the land of the living for the transgression as a substitute, as a payment for the transgression of my people, to whom the blow was due, emphasizing that that the blow is due to my people. They are guilty. They are the ones who are to receive the penalty, but instead it falls upon the servant. Now, I'm going to change the slide. I still have that, that corrected translation from the margin of the NIV at the bottom. 
But I, at the top, I put the translation in the Tanakh. This is the Jewish Publication Society translation of the uh, Hebrew Scriptures that came out in 1986. Notice the second line has a B at the beginning and a B at the end, and that note in their margin says, this is extremely difficult, we're not sure what this means. Nearly, And that's, that's true for every, that's the difficult Hebrew phrase there. Who could describe his abode? See, it doesn't use generation, does it? So there's, there's a problem with understanding that Hebrew word uh, door. But notice how they translate the last two lines. For he was cut off from the land of the living through the sin of my people. Notice it was through, not for. But the preposition, Hebrew is a preposition of substitution. It's for, it's not through. Through the sin of my people who deserve the punishment. See, when they get to that last clause, who deserve the punishment, that gets the substitutionary idea there that they tried to avoid by using uh, through as their uh, prep- preposition in the earlier part there. They just, it, they just can't avoid the thrust of the, of the verse. So the main idea here, and this comes from the ESV translation. I didn't put it on the slide, but this is the English Standard Version. This just came out about four or five years ago. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Notice how this the the whole translation. It's they're saying the same thing as the NIV margin translation said. They take it as a as an entirety. They don't break it into a couple of sentences. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation. That is, those who were, were guilty of rejecting him, as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? In other words, who among his contemporaries realized what was going on, that he was being cut off and he was being killed and executed for the transgression of my people? And I think that's the, the best translation that I've seen of this so far. It's a very difficult, uh, very difficult translation. Now, when you get over, as we'll see in a minute, uh, get over into the uh, Acts 8 passage and the quote from the Septuagint, the Septuagint reads much differently, but it tries to capture the sense of this idea that no one in that generation understood what was happening, that he was paying the penalty for the sins of the people. And then, as I pointed out last time in Isaiah 53, 9, they made his grave with the wicked men, plural, which indicates that he dies. That phrase, he made his grave, is a, is a euphemism for death. He he's, dies between the two uh, criminals. But the rich man, singular, is where he is, where he is buried. And for those of you who haven't been there, the distance from where, from Golgotha, the traditional site there in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, to the uh, to the tomb, is about as far as from here to the corner of the building where Aunt Pookie's restaurant is. If I'm standing on Golgotha, Aunt Pookie's is where the the traditional burial site was located, and that's pretty well attested. And if you just go about thirty feet on the other side of the uh, uh, of where they have inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they just have this sort of a tent because there's nothing there because those peace-loving Muslims in the ninth uh, or in the tenth century came along and and leveled the hill where the tomb was located. They were destroying all of the Christian and Jewish holy sites. That's what gave rise. That's what caused the First Crusade, and all of the Crusades were caused not by an aggressiveness on the part of the Christians, but because of the aggressiveness of the Muslims in capturing territory that had been under the domain of the Byzantine Empire and were, once they captured Jerusalem and the Holy Sites, not immediately, but a couple of centuries later, began to destroy those sites and to uh, raid and attack Christians who were making pilgrimages there. So the, the burial 
location there where Joseph of Arimathea had his, had his tomb was very close to this site where the crucifixion took place. The crucifixion took place in a rock quarry that was right, right next to the highway. And it's in this, this rugged terrain that there were, there were many uh, caves, some of which were hollowed out to be used as graves. And if you go about 30 feet or so on the other side of the traditional site of the grave, uh, inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you can go into a small room and there are small uh, first century tombs that are there. There's nothing in any of those tombs. There's about uh, three or four of them and everybody goes and we crouch down and go in with look in a flashlight and you can see what they, uh, what they look like. So all this area is very, very close together. The last part of verse 9 says, because he had done no violence from his any deceit in his mouth, he was not uh, guilty of any sin or any crime uh, whatsoever. Let's go to, why am I backing up? I see like something duplicate. Okay, verse, uh, verse 10. Yet it, now we come to the conclusion in Isaiah 53. The last three verses, verse 9, there's debate. I think that verse 9 is probably where God begins to speak, but it's clear he begins to, to speak, or Isaiah begins to speak in verse 10 to give the conclusion. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now it's very clear here, uh, excuse me, let's go back to verse 8. I'm not going to put, go find the slide again, but at the end of verse 8, we read, for the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. It's very clear there that the, that the servant is distinct from the people. The servant is the one who is struck and who pays the penalty for the transgressions of my people. I don't see how, how you can argue that the servant is just another term for the people in light of that verse. And now this verse, it pleased the Lord to bruise him he has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin so that the life of the servant is the one that is made an offering for sin. As, as I pointed this out the last time, uh, this off word offering for sin is the same word used for a sin offering or trespass offering in Leviticus. He shall see his seed. He, that is God, shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his, uh, in his hand. The same words for bruise and grief are the words that are used back in verse 4, uh, connecting the passage together so that the opening, uh, opening part, the, uh, the uh, section dealing with the, in 53, uh, 3, rather, the man of sorrows acquainted with grief. These are the same words that are used here. He's despised and we did not esteem him. This is the conclusion connecting it back to, to verse 3. He's a sin offering. As I pointed this out, we went through it last time in, Isaiah, in Leviticus 5, 6, 5, 7, 5, 15. Same word that's used for offering. He's viewing this, the servant as a sin offering. So it's a technical term, asham, that is used, used here. Then in verse 11, one of the most significant verses in this whole section, he, and we have to identify who's the he and who's the his, he shall see the labor of his soul. The he here is God the, God the Father, shall see the labor of his soul, which refers to the servant, and be satisfied. That's the doctrine of propitiation. The righteousness and the justice of God is satisfied by the sacrifice, the sin offering of the servant on the cross. By his knowledge, that is, by learning about him, by the knowledge about the servant, by his knowledge, my righteous servant, at this point it's God speaking, my righteous servant shall justify many. And this is the same word that is used uh, for justification back in Genesis 15, 6, when, when we learned that Abraham was justified by faith and by faith alone, not by works. So by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, 
for, and here it's the sense of explanation, and it literally it means and, but it's, it's explaining it. He shall bear their iniquities. He carries that. He carries that penalty in his body. It's a, a substitutionary term, uh, saval, used to bear or carry a load for someone else. And this is the same word that is used uh, earlier in verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs. And it's the second word, carried our sorrows. So God then concludes, therefore, in verse 12, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, indicating ultimately his victory over those who have unjustly condemned him. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death. This isn't just suffering. This is one of the views is that the suffering isn't fatal. This is just a picture of the suffering of the Jewish people over time. But uh, it, it, it just doesn't fly. I mean, the idea that they were, they were like a lamb, uh, oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, just doesn't apply to... Sometimes there, there's the attempt to identify this as a Jewish people going through the Holocaust. They opened their mouth. There was a lot of crying and yelling and, and, and trying to get attention as to what was going on in Europe under the Nazis. They did not keep their mouth silent through the whole process. It just doesn't, doesn't fit. It has to apply to an individual. He poured out his soul into death. He was numbered. He was identified with the transgressors. And he bore, there's that word nasa. This is the first word that's used back in verse 4. Surely he's borne our griefs. Uh, He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So he stands in their place, and that last phrase, he made intercession for the transgressors, indicates his high priestly role in place of or as a substitute for the transgressors. I wanted to give you just another um, example here. We have uh, verse 12 at the bottom. Is from the uh, 1985 Tanakh. Assuredly, I will give him uh, the many as his portion. He shall receive the multitude as his spoil, for he exposed himself to death, and he was numbered among the sinners, whereas he bore the guilt of the many and made intercession for sinners. See, even in the Tanakh, it cannot, they cannot get away from the substitutionary aspect of what the servant would do for the sinners. Now, back to Acts 8. So we can leave Isaiah 53 now, and we've gotten our background, understand the, understanding the framework for the discussion that would have taken place between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Many times, as I pointed out earlier, when the New Testament quotes one or two verses from a passage, it is really alluding to the entire passage, not just those one or two verses. And that would be the case here. He's asking a specific question of whom is this passage speaking, but Philip would have explained the entire uh, passage to him. We see the comparison here, Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. On the left, I've underlined uh, m- most of the section that is quoted, uh, the second half of verse 7. Uh, is led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before it shears silence, so he opened not his mouth. And then the first part of Isaiah 53, 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment, is then, ta- the way that's handled in the, in the Septuagint is so- a summary of his, uh, of his humiliation and not receiving justice. There's a perversion of justice that took place when... If that, that phrase, he was taken from prison and from judge, judgment, refers to his arrest and trial, it is summarized in the Septuagint translation as a humiliation because justice was perverted at that time. So the, the Septuagint does not translate it word for word, but expresses the idea that is present in the Masoretic text. And then, and who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And in the original, it says he was cut off from the land of the living. So the Septuagint interprets that as his physical uh, physical death. Now, having read that, the eunuch then turns to Philip in verse 34 and says, 
I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? And as we have seen now through this extensive study of Isaiah 53, it cannot refer to any other person in history. can't refer to a prophet, can't refer to Isaiah, can't refer to the Jewish people because he's a righteous servant. They're not righteous, as we've seen again and again. They are condemned uh, many times throughout this section of Isaiah as being unrighteous unrighteous and sinners. And so Philip then explains this, verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, see it doesn't say that's the only thing he talked about was those two verses. Beginning at this scripture, he preached, which means he is giving the gospel, he's proclaiming Jesus to him. He is explaining the gospel uh, of Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, when we get to verse 36, we see a response. There's no indication here of what the Ethiopian eunuch says. He said, wow, that's great. I believe that. We don't see his response. We see the result of his response. And the result of his response is that he, when they, see, when they come to some water, the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Now, we don't know how he learned about baptism. Did he see Christians getting baptized in Jerusalem? Or has Philip explained this to him already? See, there's a lot left out of, of, the, uh, of, of, of the summary of Philip's conversation with the eunuch. But we understand it because we see the results of it. So immediately uh, the eunuch understands. He, he wouldn't ask this if he hadn't already believed. So all of that is, is left out of the account, but it's understood that he has believed and he wants to be baptized. He wants to be understood that this is a responsibility and that he needs to be baptized. And it's immediate. It, he's not waiting for a class in basic doctrine. He's not waiting to join the church. He's not waiting until he gets a little bit older to make sure he really understood the gospel. It, it is a, an immediate response that he is uh, being baptized. This is emphasized uh, throughout the scriptures. Now, I've pointed this out before that there are uh, some people who have tried to indicate that baptism is not for today. The largest group that has done this are known as ultra-dispensationalists. Now, dispensationalists are those who believe that, uh, that God has or God administers history in different ways in different periods of time. It's very obvious that as, as Lewis Berry Chafer put it one time, if you're not taking a lamb to Jerusalem to sacrifice every year at Passover, you're a dispensationalist. Things are different now than they were before Christ died on the cross. So at the very least, you're, you understand there's some difference in the way God is administering things. However, as, as Dr. Charles Ryrie indicated in his book on dispensationalism, there's a little more to it than that. What makes a dispensationalist a dispensationalist, uh, according to Ryrie, were three, three things. First of all, a, literal, a consistent literal interpretation of Scripture. Secondly, a distinction between uh, God's plan for Israel and God's plan for the church. And third, that everything in, in, in God's plan is ultimately related to the glorification uh, of, of God. And that's a little hard for some people to understand. It first became clear to me when I realized that for in reform theology you, they only they look at all the bible as simply related to salvation that's the overriding theme the problem is that angels don't fit into that theme and there's other things that don't fit into that theme so it's a, that's too narrow of a theme you need something broader so that's what Ryrie was was was, was getting at is is that particular aspect but that second feature is what's so important that consistent distinction between Israel and the church when does that come to bear? Did that not come to bear until A.D. 70? Or did that come to bear in, in uh, A.D. 33 on the day of Pentecost? Or did, it, did that distinction occur when the gospel in Acts 10 first went to the Gentiles with Cornelius? Or does it not occur until Paul dies? And you have a, a, a group of dispensationalists came out of the uh, early dispensationalism in the 19th century, and they tried to put the beginning of the church age at, in Acts 10, 
Others put it uh, later on when uh, uh, Paul first began to go out and in Acts 13 to take the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. Others came along and said it wasn't until uh, the church age really didn't begin until either the close of Acts or, or AD 70. But what makes a difference between being under the law and the legal, dispensa- the legal dispensation and the grace dispensation, as I pointed out last Thursday night, is the baptism by means of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes the difference. And that's Acts 2. And you can't have, even though you're in a tra- it's in a transition period, you can't come along and say, well, there were some features that were this way and some features that were that way. Uh, and, and so the church really doesn't begin until sometime later in Acts. And that was the argument of, of the uh, hyper-dispensationalists or the ultra-dispensationalists. And so they said that, that um, came to a conclusion that baptism really only had significance in relationship to the Jews. Well, if that were true, then why is Paul baptizing Corinthians? And he did, even though he said, I'm glad I didn't baptize all of you. The point, the reason he said that in Acts, I mean, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, was because they were abusing his authority and they were identifying themselves, splitting up into factions, depending on who baptized different believers. So if you got baptized by uh, Apollos, then you, you weren't in the same class as those who were baptized by Paul or those who were baptized by, by Peter or somebody else. So they were dividing up. And Paul h- hated that, and he rejects that. So he says, I'm glad I didn't baptize all of you. He didn't say, I'm glad I didn't baptize anybody because baptism's out. He doesn't mean that. The same time he wrote that, he's in Ephesus. And in Ephesus, chap- I mean, in Acts chapter 19, as we'll see, all of a sudden, these, these old, they're, they're really sort of Old Testament saints, John the Baptist's disciples, who've been baptized by John the Baptist, and they understood his message and repented. So that's sort of an, that's an Old Testament sanct, uh, salvation. Now they come to Ephesus, and what's the question that Paul asks? Were you baptized in the name of Jesus? So what that question summarizes is, have you trusted in Jesus as a Messiah? They said, we don't know anything about this Jesus. And so he explains the gospel to them, and then he baptizes them in the name of Jesus. That's the issue. And that's the same thing we see here in, in Acts, is that he is uh, going to be baptized in the name of Jesus. It's that identification with Jesus as a picture of 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 identification with Christ in the baptism by means of the Holy Spirit. So the Ethiopian eunuch understands the significance of that, and he says, well, here's water, let's do it now. Now, we don't know exactly where that was, as I said the last time, but along these roads going to Jerusalem, about a day's journey out from Jerusalem, they have discovered uh, various uh, places where they baptized the uh, or where they had the the cleansing ritual um, cisterns for the Jews that were coming to worship at the uh, at the temple, and that is as good a guess as anybody has as to where this occurred. The next verse, which you'll find in your King James version and New King James version, is probably not in the original at all. Uh, it's got a theological problem. I'll read the verse. It says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you don't have that kind of language anywhere else. That implies that if you don't believe with all your heart, you really weren't saved. You can have a half-hearted belief. That, that just doesn't fit with anything else in, in Scripture, number one. Number two, it's only in a very few manuscripts that are traced to one geographical area. And it's not in most manuscripts. When I say most manuscripts, I'm not talking about the majority text. Neither the critical text nor the majority text uh, include this verse. It is universally recognized by scholars that this verse was inserted late in the manuscript tradition and is not part of the original text just on the basis of its, of its textual history. And you'll probably see a note to that effect uh, in your Bibles. So that's not an issue. The only people that would be concerned about that would be the w- strange people who are King James only. Now, somebody will probably get mad at me for saying that, but if you believe that Paul spoke in 
Elizabethan English, then face it, you're strange. If you think that God the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible in King James English, either you're strange or you're a Mormon. See, that's one of the problems with the Book of Mormon is in early 19th century America, Joseph Smith translates the Book of Mormon into Elizabethan English. Irrational. Acts 39 then. Now when they came up out of the water, now this is interesting, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Now does this mean that the Holy Spirit, as he had before, just told Philip, okay, it's time to leave, we're going to the next place, or is there a supernatural transportation that takes place here? I tend to think it's a supernatural transportation that takes place here because of the suddenness of the of the vocabulary and the, and the narrative here. And also the vocabulary here. The verb is harpazo, which doesn't necessarily mean a supernatural snatching away, but it is used that, that way. It has a primary meaning of making off with someone else's property by attacking or seizing it. So uh, if a thief breaks into your house and seizes property and leaves, that's harpazo. But it's also used to remove something or gain control of something, to snatch something or take it away. This is the word that is used for the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. It's used 13 times in the New Testament when Jerome translated the uh, uh, New Testament into Latin. He chose the word rapio, as the verb, which is where we get our word rapture. Rapture doesn't come from a Greek word. It comes from the Latin word that translated harpazo. So every now and then you'll hear somebody who says, well, you people believe in the rapture. That's not even in the Bible. Yes, it is. Just go read your Vulgate. There are seven raptures, actually, in in the Scripture. There's the rapture of Enoch. He does not die. The oldest man in the Bible is Methuselah. But he died before his father did. That's because Enoch was taken to be directly with God. He was walking with God one day and just walked into heaven. The next rapture in the Bible is in Elijah. Elijah goes up alive in a chariot. 2 Kings chapter 2. Third rapture is Isaiah. Isaiah goes to the throne of God. And he's before the throne of God. And has some sort of body that allows him to do that and to feel and experience things. He comes back to the earth, and Jesus goes to be with the Father in heaven. Philip gets harpazoed from the the road to Gaza to uh, uh, Ashdod, or Zotus as it's put in the text, and then Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and then uh, the church at the end of the tribulation. So Philip gets harpazoed, and then he's found or discovered at Azotus, which is modern Ashdod. You'll read about Ashdod in the, in the press because the uh, Hamas in Gaza like to uh, shoot rockets at Ashdod. Ashdod is under uh, Israeli control. Here's a map showing you their lo- the locations of this verse. Uh, Azotus or Ashdod is down here in the south. This is near the territory that was once part of the uh, Philistia. This is Jerusalem down here in the lower right. The green line here is the road that goes from uh, Jerusalem down to, it's off the map, but down to Gaza. And then up here, the red circle up at the top is Caesarea by the sea or Caesarea Maritima, built by that great architect of the ancient world, Herod the Great. And it was a primarily a Gentile city. It was the capital of of uh, the province, and it was also a scene where there was a brutal massacre of all the Jews who lived there in A.D. 66. Now, it's mentioned again, when Philip is mentioned again, in Acts chapter 21, and this is the home of Philip and his daughters. Were they still alive and living there in 66 during the beginning of the Jewish revolt, and were they massacred by the Romans along with the Jews? We don't know. But that is what happened to the Jews in, in Caesarea. So the last verse of chapter eight, Philip was found at Azotus and he passed or Ashdod, 
And he passing through, he preached or proclaimed the good news of the gospel in all the cities until he came to Caesarea. And we know that from Acts 21, that's where he uh, eventually settled. So here we see the inclusion of a black Gentile, but he's not considered full, a full Gentile because the text treats Cornelius in Acts 10 as the first Gentile convert to the church. Why? Because he's not a full Gentile. He is a Gentile who is a proselyte to Judaism. And so it's not going to be until Acts 10 that we see the full inclusion of Gentiles into the body of Christ. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to uh, come before you and uh, study your word this evening, to be challenged in terms of our own evangelism, to come to a better understanding of passages that we can use when we witness to those around us. And Father, we pray that you would help us be faithful in communicating the gospel verbally to those, uh, to those around us. Father, we continue to pray for this man who wrote in, Peter Till, and we pray for him and his church, and we pray that you would supply the resources that they need and that they might have uh, the courage, the strength, and safety to proclaim the truth there in the Czech Republic. Uh, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.